Steven, welcome back. It's good to be back. I am bringing Steven on because when I want to know about the market, Steven's who I call. Um, Steven has had a pulse on the DFW market, especially. Um, and we're kind of in an interesting period right now. The last few years have been crazy. Industrial still going bananas, but you know the market's kind of changing, and we just wanted to talk about that today. So thank you uh, for agreeing to do another update. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be on the podcast. It's an honor. All right, here we go. So let's talk about, I think we can kind of say 2021 <clears throat> ended with a bang. Interest rates stayed at all-time lows. Capital's flowing in like crazy. Texas is hot. And I'm not saying a lot of those have changed, but interest rates have certainly changed. Um, but let's just kind of talk about the state of the market right now, kind of post-2022, and where you see a lot of the opportunities and maybe where some of the cracks are in the market. Yeah. So first off, uh, the market fundamentals are at an all-time high. The rental rate growth that we're experiencing, uh, the vacancy rates, um, just the number of proposals on vacancy. Um, and then when a operator has the opportunity to get to their rent roll right now, mm. it's, uh, it's crazy what they're seeing. They're seeing 30, 50 plus percent mark to market. And um, the fundamentals are great. Now on the back end, it's an interesting dynamic when they say, okay, what is the state of the value of my property? Mm -hmm. And they talk to us at that point. What the market is now looking at from a buy perspective is different than what the operator might have just achieved. Right. And what, that mean, what I mean by that is uh, a, a buyer is looking for opportunity right now. And because debt markets have moved and they've increased, term is now not your friend and that is hurting ultimately the cash flow in which uh, they were able to underwrite the property before. These oh. low cap rate deals are moving a little bit right now because of where interest rates have also moved. Yep. Um, the market wants anything that they're going to be able to capture their fundamentals within their hold period. So as a operator, you, you hold all the cards yep. and you say, okay, I, I have the ability to sign a five, seven year lease, 10 year lease right now. Unfortunately, that could ultimately hurt you on value. Um, however, you are without, without maybe you knowing it, not doing that lease or signing a short term lease is actually going to be able to maximize your value right now. Yep. And the market, because the fundamentals are so strong, they're going to be able to underwrite the best, the best rate, the best, best terms. And as a seller and operator, if you are looking to exit right now, you're still going to get that credit without even having to do it. So if, if somebody's going to market right now and they're wanting to sell, basically the story right now, it's a Walt game. It's a Walt game. You want a low Walt to bring to market. Correct. The more you extend that, you're getting dinged right now. Yep. So if you look at how the market has changed and what has been least impacted, it's been anything with, with lower walt. Right. So we have seen pricing come in. Um, and again, it's, this is funny, the market's so volatile right now and, and uh, it moves so fast, I should say, that by the time this thing airs to the public, who knows what's gonna happen. Yeah. Dow could be 36 again and <laughs> cap rates could be sub three, who knows. Um, but right now, just saying kind of stay in the market and where we are today, um, the the lower Walt, the quicker you have the opportunity to get to the rent roll, um, it I would say pricing has changed. It has been less affected. Now, if you have a tenured lease deal, uh, that is directly impacted on where debt is pricing today. For everybody listening, we're recording. It is 3.18 p.m. <laughs> on May 12th. We're going to try and get this episode out as quickly as possible yeah. in the next couple of weeks. So uh, whatever you're hearing is is going to be a little delayed, but we'll see. Um, when did you kind of notice that the market was becoming volatile? Was it purely when interest rates started to rise? I mean, was that the trigger? It was. Yeah. It was. And I mean, look, if you look at what, what's happened within the last... 60, 90 days, interest rates uh, have moved 200 plus basis points. Yep. And um, that obviously affects your cash flow. 
Yeah. Um, the other thing is there's been so many IRR driven buyers out there that this affects many aspects of kind of their underwriting. Yeah. It now affects the exit caps in which they're having to underwrite. Um, I actually see this as an opportunity, by the way. Yeah. Uh, volatility <clears throat> uh, can be your friend because what's what's occurring right now is sellers have have experienced such appreciation within their assets that if they see some sort of volatility where the market's coming back a little bit, they'll be willing to sell. And the buyers could be capturing right now, in my opinion, a a good opportunity because the market is really baked in a lot of this volatility already within their underwriting. They're actually underwriting right now more conservative than they have in the past, gosh, 10 years, yeah. where if you have a deal that you're buying right now, all the holes have been poked on it. And it's a very healthy buy because you're looking at it through a very healthy lens. Yeah. Euphoria is fun, but you don't always give it the look maybe it deserves when everything is, you know, up and to the right. And it seems like it's never going to end. Yep. Um, we talked about fundamentals are really strong. I think one of the great things about real estate is you hear like, oh, the real estate market. But everything is so localized now. When we talk about like DFW, maybe the most important Metroplex right now in the entire country, we talk about rents are rising. Okay, why are they rising? Population growth through an all, all time high, companies and jobs moving here like never before. So everything fundamentally is intact. Now the stock market is tanking, but then on the other side, and we'll get into this, vacancies at all time low, rental rates are bumping 30 to 50%. Um, and so when you're seeing now buyers coming in, are buyers now redirecting more of their capital to markets like ours? Are buyers right now kind of watching what's going on and where you might've had 200 buyers in a data room 90 days ago, now there's less, like how are buyers treating it? Now you said they're underwriting deals, uh, and taking in all accounts of what's going on, but like where what are you seeing like with capital flows is it pausing a little is it is there more showing up in dfw because of what we have like what's happening there um the equity is still there and everybody still believes in dfw and what's not to i mean again you look at the fundamentals and everything is pointing upwards um on deals that we're selling right now 60 days ago 90 days ago our ca list did take a dip uh, right now, we're back to first beginning of first quarter figures, yeah. which what that indicates is there's so much equity chasing industrial right now. Yeah. We're purely just in a pricing discovery mode. Yeah. And there's we still have on a given deal that would have had 20 offers in January. Those still 20 groups will offer on your deal. Now, it's just purely a function of price and yeah. where they are able to um, what levers they're able to really lean in on right now um so there's there's still plenty of interest Um, our bid sheets right now currently are going to be a little lighter we're not going to have all those 20 groups show up on a deal um it and again it's a purely a function of price you're going to be you're going to be uh maybe three to five deep in the whisper guidance and the emotional pricing that we saw um fourth quarter, first quarter of this year, yeah. where groups kind of in the last rounds of bid bidding processes were kind of covering their eyes going, oh my gosh, I, I just have to have this deal. The emotional pricing is there. We look at where it ends up on a valuation standpoint, you're going, these metrics don't necessarily work, but however, there's other factors internally that they're having to check off to acquire industrial. Right now, they're poking all the necessary holes. And so I think it is actually a very healthy time yeah. to buy. Um, the Fed's kind of said there's going to be another rate increase coming. Obviously, you just said a lot of this stuff is priced in. Are folks still able to get debt terms pretty quickly right now? And they might not be what they were 90 days ago, but they're still getting term sheets. Or are lenders right now a little more hesitant to, you know, give an exact number and if things move from an, uh, uh, an adjustable rate to a fixed rate, like what do you, let's talk about capital markets. 
the debt markets are still there too. And yeah. again, very similar to the equity markets, they're also in a pricing discovery mode. So as the indices have uh, have had have shown volatility and have increased, so have the spreads. Um, and so it's been a double whammy. And you're seeing uh, ten year is has been a ninety basis point uh, has fluctuated ninety basis points in the last what sixty days. Yeah. But spreads have also uh, fluctuated as well. So it, it's lenders are still out there. They're still plentiful. It's it's purely just a function of price. Um, I'll, I'll I'll even take a step backwards. Um, and again, why I'm saying that I I do believe this is truly a a great opportunity. You look at just kind of markets in which we've experienced volatility right now. It's been the GFC. Uh, unbelievable buying opportunity. Any dip, it was the contrarian who took advantage of that thrived. The COVID, same thing. And now I would say with volatility within interest rates, uh, with great volatility <laughs> creates unbelievable opportunity. And we're experiencing that right now. And I think the great thing about what folks, you know, it's important to continuously bring this up. You know, a lot of what we do with Stephen and a lot of what Stephen focuses on is a class B market, which has already built properties. This is still an asset class that an asset class that despite a 12 year bull run, 13 year bull run, there is no new supply coming on or no new meaningful supply. And you could make an argument we're actually decreasing supply. I mean, you go look at Brook Hollow Design District, buildings are being taken out of the grid to do other things. And so um, when you have job growth, wage growth, population growth at all time highs, um, you know, interest rates can do enough to slow something down, but there is a engine pushing this market that's that's based on fundamentals. Okay. Um, let's talk about some of the things going on in capital markets. I know you brought some some talking points. Let's just like go through them. Some of the things that we're focused on where capital is still eager to deploy is in low CapEx product types. So industrial checks that box. Yep. Okay. Um, office right now, when because costs are rising across the board, uh, office TIs are going to be 50 plus a foot. Industrial, we're still seeing these as is deals, and you're purely just getting to capture rental rate growth. Um, so when we do stabilize from a uh, on kind of the market sentiment, I'm gonna act, I, I I'm a true believer that you're probably still gonna see cap rate compression after they have widened, purely because this is the asset class that. Uh, that is still experiencing fundamentals where you're seeing growth. And then on the back end, you're just not getting eaten up through cash flow. And, um, and your TIs are still going to be low on the back end. Okay. Um, one thing we didn't talk about that I skipped over, but I want to go back to it is when we're talking about the pool of buyers and the last three years, I think the COVID taught us a couple things. Um, but one that I keep thinking about is you you essentially need rooftops and you need industrial buildings to run the world. You need shelter to shelter people in. You need industrial buildings to make products, warehouse products, distribute products. Um, and then retail, office, hotel, that's all nice to have. Maybe we need data centers now. You can't turn those off. We run on data centers. Maybe a couple others I'm missing. But how many of these buyers are kind of like they were office people forever. They were retail people forever. How many are like these new entrants into industrial versus kind of the incumbents that have been doing this for decades? Because when I look at, um, you know, data rooms and I look at lists of who shows up when we've gone to sell, you know, we'll even talk about it. I'll be like, these 20 groups are all brand new to this game. They're all just raised their first fund. Like they got to get into the market. How, how, I guess the question is, if you had to, guess on a percentage like how many new buyers have entered the industrial market in the last 24 months oh gosh 24 months i would say it's our ca list 24 months ago would look drastically different yeah because it's it's groups sometimes when they have great success they ebb and flow in and out of the market naturally yeah. because the market moves um their mindset is 
industrial was fifty dollars a foot in the in the early two thousands, um, it should still be fifty dollars a foot. And so that when it skyrockets to one hundred and fifty dollars a foot, they're going, "Whoa, whoa um, that just feels rich to me." Yeah. Um, however, there's just new buckets of capital being raised every single day, and um, it's I would say it's fifty percent of our CA list wow. within twenty four months is our new entrance within the within the space. Um, we actually track on some of our pitch materials who the likely buyers are, yeah. and I've got a list of twenty four names and kind of descriptions behind the capital of these twenty four groups. Of those, ten are new entrants within mm. the last twenty four months. Then we. We brag and get to say we brought them to our backyard. Yeah. Um, every single day that we're we're still seeing new groups that on a CA list we're going. I have no idea who this group is. They kind of a funny name. Let's call them. <laughs> 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 and then you call them. You're going, oh my god, they just raised a hundred million dollar fund. Yeah, yeah, they're legit. Um, so yes, it's 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 still evolving. What uh, this one on my list, but like when you were. What due diligence do you do on buyers to go, you know, I guess anybody could bid on a deal, but your job is to make a transaction happen. Your job is to not waste the seller's time. What goes, what happens at JLL when, when somebody's going like, Hey, we want to bid on this. What are you looking for to go? This is a qualified bidder. Is it the amount of money they have? Do they have to send you a track record? Do you get references? Like what would be a reason you might say this group probably isn't qualified to be bidding on here? Yeah, we. We first ask where their funds come from. Yeah. Uh, is there are their funds discretionary? Uh, we want to make sure that nothing happens from the equity front first and foremost on how uh, how they're able to acquire the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, that's just one aspect. A lot of people have capital right now, so trying to differentiate yourself and and money's green no matter what hands. And now it's how you underwrite the property. Yep. If you underwrote it accurately, we can we can decipher just by talking to someone on a buyer interview whether they're taking the correct view on how this property should perform. Um, if they if if we catch anything where if they under they didn't underwrite capital appropriately, capex, um, that's going to be a red flag, and we know that something could pop up during due diligence. Yeah. Um, or if they were conservative on on certain aspects of their underwriting, we we hold that either to their benefit or against them. Yep. Um okay, going back a little bit now to to operators having more leverage. Let's just talk a little bit more about the leases. So we talked about uh in uh long-term leases right now could not work in your favor. What other terms in the lease are you seeing? A, a lot of people are asking about rent bumps. Is that tied to just your typical now three and four percent? Is it tied to C CPI? Anything else interesting popping up in leases besides term and uh, dollar amount that you know something we should know about? I I would say you're gonna you're gonna start seeing rent bumps increase because we've started to see just such great mark to market. Uh, that DFW being the good old boy market that it is, it's always been, this is going to be a 3% annual bump. And our, uh, our leasing brokers just quote, quote it that way. I think we have to start pushing where annual bumps need to be. If every single time you're seeing a mark to market of 30 plus percent uh, and the market's giving you credit for that 30 plus percent, we're going to have to start seeing that filter into what is contractual. Yeah. Um, and that will mitigate the the problem that we're having right now on longer term leases are a detriment to the underwriting. Yeah. Um, so that will probably I, I imagine that's going to continue to occur right now. We're seeing four percent. Uh, we've seen five percent in small kind of incubator type spaces already. Yeah. Um, and those are tenants that if you think about it, those are the mom and pops that are getting the most that are get, already seeing the highest rental rates yep. contractual these larger corporations they have the ability to stomach that as well yeah 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 we were talking to a uh, ceo of a large fund out of um canada and we just were having a candid conversation with him is why does the same tenant in one market pay you know 15 or 16 dollars 
rents. And they and in DFW they're paying seven dollars. Are they doing more sales in that market? And the and the answer pretty much is no. It just costs more in that market. Like there's room in these PNLs for these landlords and these tenants. Um, That's exactly right. And we're kind of discovering that as we as we keep going. Well, and, and the beauty is, it's our operators in our backyard now are getting sophisticated as well. Yeah. And so you're seeing it firsthand within your portfolio and already uh, already comparing different markets to what's happening in your backyard yep. well because dfw has become such an institutional market um and institutions and sophisticated owners are now gobbling up the majority of the product you're going to see that and you're not having to compete with some operator who's a little bit lost in what's happening in the world yep um okay how does um how does Texas, you know, you get to talk to your counterparts around the country and other markets. Um, there's a lot of great markets out there. It's not just all happening in Texas, but how is Texas comparing to some of the other hot markets? Is there anything that kind of comes to mind when I say why Texas, uh, as opposed to maybe some of these other great markets? It's, I, I think it's, it's kind of actually a simpler <laughs> answer than you think it's just it's a business friendly state yeah and just the regulations that we have in our backyard and our state uh is why we're experiencing the population growth that we are and it's not just happening in dfw it's happening in austin it's happening in san antonio um also just from a location standpoint we're central u.s you look at uh going back to kind of the industrial perspective just truck times and just the amount of population that you're able to reach in a 24 hour or 36 hour period, you're getting to the majority of the population in the entire country just from where we're located. So yep. it's a, it is, it's twofold. It's being a business friendly state and it's, it's where we're located. All right. I got to ask one question about Amazon. They came out the other day and said, we might stop growing. This was a public announcement from them. This is no secret. They just said we might slow growth a little bit um, and kind of grow into our space. On the flip side of that, you have this long list of tenants that have not been able to lease space because Amazon's been leasing it all up. Just, just talk a little what what might be the shorter term impact on that? If they've kind of stated they're going to do that, how do you see the rest of the, Does that give other companies now an opportunity to catch up? What What will happen? What are you guys predicting? Yeah. So Amazon, uh, a couple things to touch on. Um, Amazon, it, it just feels like they they have been ahead of the curve. And so during COVID, they saw what was happening before everybody else. They had to essentially double their footprint during 2020. Wow. And they did. Um, what they have the ability to do internally, too, is their warehouses are more efficient. And they now realize because of how efficient they are inside their box, uh, the amount of growth, they don't need to grow as fast anymore. Yep. Um, now the rest of the market and the other retailers or the big box users out there, they are still in growth mode and they did not get to experience the double their capacity uh, like Amazon projected during the volatile time. Yep. They are now one step behind and they're playing catch up yeah. so that's that's i mean right now in dfw there's probably 10 million square foot users out out there and there's only 1 million square foot building available so again there's more tenant demand than there's uh building that's available and was a lot of that just because landlords when when given two term sheets were like we're going to take amazon <laughs> yes so yeah. that, that was a lot of the advantage they had. And, and what they didn't know is Amazon, if if the building was under construction um, and Amazon came knocking, Amazon knew kind of the big stick that they held. Yeah. And um, and they were going to compress your yield on cost figures drastically. Yeah. Um, and they they were going <laughs> to the landlord was going to do well regardless. Yeah. However, if they continued to build their building. Um, they would probably still be able to land Amazon at the end of the day. Yeah. And you're being able, at that point, you're going to capture the full spread in which you underwrote um, as a developer. 
So we talked about in the class B space, and, and these are much smaller tenants. I mean, we're talking anywhere from 1,500 square feet to maybe a couple hundred thousand at the largest. I mean, that's a wide range. Mm -hmm. But we talked about shorter lease terms. On these million square foot deals, are those landlords opting for shorter lease terms? And will companies that large that are going to make an investment that big in a building accept a five-year lease term? Or is it pretty much always a 10-year deal? Uh, no, again, interesting dynamic and it's an interesting debate that landlords or developers are having with their tenants right now yeah uh we are selling a five hundred thousand square foot building and we just went through this same exercise advising our developer who's going to be a seller shorter is going to be better now there's some optics to the shorter is better i wouldn't sign a 12 month lease as a as a 500 plus thousand square foot uh in a 500 thousand square foot building you need to show some tenant commitment. So we were advising, hey, you should sign a five-year lease. Uh, the tenant, knowing kind of where the market's moving, they're arguing for a 10-year lease. And we ended up in the middle of seven years. So uh, these users, they are sophisticated as well. They know what's happening. They're seeing the growth. There's just like we mentioned already, they're seeing what's happening in other markets, applying it to our backyard. Um, and they want to lock in their rate. Because yeah. the market will continue to move. I'm going to try and ask this the right way. You talked to like Greg Gordon with Gordon Highlander. I was talking to him the other day. He does some of the biggest interior finish outs of industrial buildings. He's a great guy, by yeah. the way. Gordo, he's going to be on this podcast here in a few weeks. But he was just talking about like the detailed finish out that these big tenants are putting into these. It's like unprecedented of, of what we've seen. And what you haven't really seen yet, because this all kind of started in the last 10 years is a lot of these leases rolling. Now, you, there's been some that roll, but when you think about the, the amount of investment in these buildings, the cost that, that probably took them to invest in those buildings, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago compared to that cost today, um, like what would be a reason a tenant that has a million square feet want to move to another million square foot building and have we like found that answer? Is there enough like data out yet? Or is, are we, if I was making a, a prediction as a dummy, I'd go, it pretty much seems like they're going to stay put. <laughs> it, it, it feels that way. And, and the other thing to note is if you're, if, uh, if a tenant's looking to move, it's probably going to be location driven. Mm. Well, the building in which they're in is probably going to be a better location because everything else that is going to be new construction is now going to be a little bit more on the periphery. Yep. You talked about 10 tenants, 10-ish tenants in the market for a million square feet, only one building available. Is there only one building available because it's being leased up so fast that developers can't keep up? Why is there only one develop one? <laughs> there building? there are more there are more coming. Coming. Yeah, it's yeah. just by happenstance right now that it's uh one is currently available. Um, there, there are developers that are actively building million square footers, knowing that the demand is already out there. And is the majority of new development right now with a tenant in tow, or is it still spec? Um, we are, we're about a 35, 30 to 40% pre-lease market right now. Okay. Um, so the majority of these developers are, are building spec. Okay. Um, however, they know that if the activity continues, they're probably going to see two to three proposals yeah. uh, on their space uh, if they're experiencing vacancy and it's, it's, it's delivered. Are you seeing landlords right now, just given the volatility and you know the, the market news, maybe where you weren't seeing it in 2021, take a bird in the hand a lot quicker? They still, I mean, you were hearing in 2021, these developers were holding out till the very end of their development to sign their lease. Has that moved at all? Uh, Yes, I mean we're still seeing pre-leasing activity. Yeah. Um. And again, it's it's the landlord's market, yeah. and so they they kind of hold the cards yeah. still. Um. Now, do trees grow the sky? No, they don't. But right now, um, we we're, they they have the flexibility in hand. I think part of it is a lot of these developers are now looking at the exit, okay. and so it's not just the tenants that they have to underwrite. It's how does how do their costs and where's the market going to be underwriting a uh, 
a, a, a lease in place versus even a forward market where you're going, okay, I know the market is volatile right now. Um, speaking of burden in hand, someone's going to be underwriting this at an X yield on cost figure. Well, that's so far inside of where we are building this. Uh, we're willing to ch- to sell this property on a on a forward basis. Okay. Um, real quick, going back to just Amazon becoming way more efficient within the warehouse. Is that a trend we expect to see with a lot of these businesses where it's not going to be necessarily as much about how much more space we can build. It's going to be more about how much juice these tenants can squeeze out of what they already have. Yeah. I mean, it, the, it, look, technology is going to continue to evolve and that's going to, that's going to take place in inside warehouses as well. Um, just the amount of product that it has to filter through. Uh, technology is definitely a, a huge factor of that. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Uh, land prices, have they kind of flattened? Are they still skyrocketing? I mean, three years ago, pre-COVID, hearing $8 industrial mm-hmm. dirt was uh, nuts. And now, three years later, you're hearing of deals that are selling almost as high as 30 bucks a foot. Yep. Um, that's a 400x return on your money, even if you were buying at the top of the market in 2019. Before that, like two, three, four dollar dirt was always the thing. Have we seen that kind of level off, or is it still going up? I would say it's probably starting to level off. Yeah. Um, and that's purely just because it, it is going to be debt re- debt market driven yeah. as well, because what it's going to do is it's going to affect some of these developers' exits, yep. the exit caps in which they're under able to underwrite. Uh, the other thing is construction costs are just going through the roof. Yep. And so if you have an in-full site, I'm just doing the math here. If you are at a mid-20 a foot uh, land basis, I mean, you're going to be, what is that, $90 a foot under the building. Yep. And then depending on what size of the building you're building, if it's a small bay building, it could be another 130 plus a foot. You're talking well under the 200s for a shallow bay building bigger box you're going to be in the in the mid hundreds um so mid high hundreds yeah um and now it's a function of math again going okay where's the rental rate in which we are able to trend rates and how aggressively can we get on what this uh where we land these leases and now what's the exit cap that we can apply on the back end are any of these developers this is a dumb question but when they get their construction loan like today Let's say they, or even a couple months ago, they got it at maybe four, four and a half percent. Are these fixed rates that they're locking in post construction that kind of roll into a perm loan? Or are they taking rate risks that they've got to refinance this deal once the building's complete? A lot of it, I mean, it it, de- it depends on the structure of, of the developer. Yeah. If they are merchant minded, they're going to take that risk. Yeah. Um, and so they're they're looking to build it as fast as they can. They're going to lease it as fast as they can, and they're going to sell it as fast as they can. Yeah. Now other now other groups, it's going to be structured differently, where it's going to be it's going to be a they'll look at it from a permanent standpoint. But the majority of our construction, our our backyard is is probably merchant minded. Yep. On the uh, on the Class B stuff, is there any is our uh, you know regional banks, life co's, private debt funds? Is there any one of those that's uh, putting more money out right now and some of them that have pulled back, are they all kind of still doing the same volume, just obviously at different terms? Uh, I, I would say it's, again, it's, it's, it's what the business plan is of the, of the buyer. Uh, we're seeing a lot of bank financing right now. Yeah. Um, the, the debt funds have gotten expensive. Um, everything's obviously it's all relative, but everything's gotten expensive. The majority of lenders that it feels like we're dealing with on the shallow bay space has been uh, has been with banks. Yeah. Um, our debt team at JLL feels like they're probably as busy as ever as well because what's happening, a lot of these operators uh, that have historically used their relationship banks or lenders, well, they now feel like they probably hold more of the cards and they're just going to quote them. I mean, just an astronomical number. And uh, it's a great time to talk to our team as well because they're going, okay, if you actually test the market, yeah. you're going to still find that outlier. Yeah. That's going to get you the tightest terms. Yep. 
We didn't talk about Fords. Let's just talk about them real quick. Everybody listening, a Ford is when basically you are doing a development and you sell that building before you're finished to a new buyer. Usually the buyer has control rights over how it's leased. That has been just booming 2020-21. Have Fords, they still booming? They slowing down? Uh, Yes, no. And so uh, a a forward is going to... Uh, fall into the category of you're getting to underwrite off of the benefit of the fundamentals of the space. Yeah. And so because you're still able as a buyer to underwrite um, the, the fundamentals of, uh, of lease up of rent growth uh, there's still plenty of capital that is hungry to be able to, um, to sell internally to their investment committee that when they buy this, they're still able to, to push into why. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, a new one that just kind of popped up on the radar, really the last, probably, I mean, it's not new, but the last couple of years has been outdoor storage. I think it's iOS, industrial outdoor mm-hmm. storage. I mean, damn, I've been hearing the prices um, lately. Uh, let's just speak a little to that. Is there more capital now for outdoor storage? And, and what's driving it? Is it kind of a zoning play? Is it this? You know, e-commerce brings a lot more trucks that we need to store. What's driving this boom? It is, it's unbelievable the amount of capital that's flooding in the space. Yeah. Um, and it, it feels like, I mean, you you, you nailed it. It's, it is a function of, of zoning. So uh, cities aren't going to rezone space to, to an iOS use. Uh, so it does feel like the... Uh, the product that is on the ground right now is going to be fixed that way for the foreseeable future. Or you're going to have to look further out. And the whole benefit of this is having an infill site that you're able to uh, park, tr- par- park trucks, uh, truck terminals, uh, lay down yards. These are necessary uh, necessary uses out there. Um, and it's a fragmented space too. Yeah. A lot of it is owner users. And so um, these funds are partnering up or these these capital sources are partnering up with operators and these operators are tasked to go out. And oftentimes these these deals are five, ten million dollars um, and they're they're dealing with sometimes unsophisticated sellers. Um, so there's a lot of rolling up your sleeves to get the deal sold. However, if you can amass a portfolio of iOS uh, truck yards or terminals or lay down yards, it feels like there's a huge portfolio premium on the back end. It feels like Shallow Bay Industrial, yeah. candidly, five years ago, yeah. seven years ago, um, because there's so much capital flooding in that space. It's just a function of being able to put it out. What was the, what was the catalyst where everybody woke up and was like, oh my gosh, we need to start buying? Because it really feels like it's been the last 24 months that it's really gone gangbusters. Yeah. Uh, well, part of it is you even when you're looking at an industrial space, what do these tenants want? They want excess parking. Yeah. Well, you're not going to get that in in fill sites. Oftentimes, these buildings are second generation where they didn't build uh, extra trailer parking or they didn't have the ability or the land to um, 10 years ago yeah. in an infill site. However, if you have a site that is zoned uh, industrial where you're able to do this, um, a lay down yard of just striping, lighting, uh, fencing, uh, space just for trailer parking. Mm. That's a significant landlord's market right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I'm going, I'm bouncing around. Sorry. Things keep coming to my head, but on the, uh, on the capital market side, I was at a deal the other day and the, 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 we already talked about low walt being huge right now. Mm -hmm. But the other thing they said was like, once you kind of get above $125 million bite, it actually, like even with low walt, I'm not saying it's not good. And I'm not saying a $200 million portfolio isn't good, but there's something that kind of changes in the debt terms that could make it a little harder to bite off. Maybe because they're taking that from the public markets or it's CMBS and it is, all adjustable like what what happens to debt when you kind of get above that 
And we don't have to make a prediction whether that's good for the market or bad. Maybe you can just answer what happens when you start getting above that purchase price. Part of it is just who's able to buy it. And yeah. so you, if you're if you're getting the the huge pension funds, the huge capital sources, they want to spend their time on something that they're able to deploy a much larger equity check. Yeah. Well, those same groups have the most um, they have the most accretive debt structures in place as well yeah. because of who uh, who's lending to them. Yeah. Um, a, a smaller deal, you're going to get more kind of mom and pops and yeah. they're going to have to test the debt markets with just a balance sheet that doesn't even compare to the the big boys. Yeah. All right. Um, we've covered a lot. Uh, I don't really have any more kind of zingers. Is is there anything we didn't cover or anything that we should talk about um, before we bring it home? And I can throw you a zinger. Well, I feel free. I'll, I'll even... I'll pass the mic. I want to hear just kind of what I'm saying, what I'm saying, and how y'all are applying this to Fort Capital. Yeah, and how uh, I love it. If there's anything that y'all are seeing within the market that maybe I can opine on, I would say um, for the first time in a long time, you know, when things are are, I, w- I would say we look back now at 2021 and go, damn, that was a good year, you know. A lot of people are asking me why we were selling and, you know, I just said, look, I, nobody knows what the market's going to do, but when it's this good, you have to take chips off the table. Um, I'm not saying that was the right or the wrong decision, but in hindsight, I'm glad we got those sales in last year that we did. Um, now, with that being said, you were talking about kind of the bid ask. There's several deals we're bidding on right now that maybe a year ago, the broker guidance would have been the seller needs this. And it was like, okay. Yep. That, that's the number. Now there's been a few situations where we go, that's great that they need that. Here's our offer though. And we're starting to see some dominoes go, they'll take that offer. Um, this isn't a function. I mean, this is a function of how real estate works. Interest rates go up, values go down. I mean, now we're experiencing an, an ironic time where um, rent growth is going up so high. Mm-hmm. You mentioned 30, 40%. That is probably accurate on... Every deal we're on, I mean, we have some deals that are 70 to 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're buying deals that on our high case scenario, even today, we bought a deal two months ago. High case scenario rent, we're still signing 30 to 40% above our high case. And so the real question for us is, um, and maybe we didn't get to this and we can talk about this for a second, um, is when do rent stop? Because if you keep looking at the market, there is no vacancy. Mm-hmm. Um, population growth is continuing to grow. And again, what I love about Class B is there is no new supply. That's and exactly if, if people saying. are building a building, it's on the outskirts of town. And what I don't think most people truly understand, and I'm not saying Class A tenants can do this either, but most Class B tenants serve a market within three, four, five mile radius of where they their building is. They can't just move 20 miles to the next building and still run their business. So you really, when you're, when you're underwriting this type of industrial, you look at, okay, what's the competing supply in three to four miles, not DFW. Now, again, I'm not saying that the class A tenants don't have a wider spread, but I think they do. I mean, they're distributing to lots of people, not a kind of micro market. So I'm always looking at, has something changed and somehow we're able to build this stuff? No. One, because there's no land infill. Two, it's too expensive, and um, it's just really not happening. Uh, we keep thinking that portfolio premiums exist, so we're still aggregating, and they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, like you said, we're we have almost two million square feet under. We're not stopping buying yeah. until the fundamentals of the market tell us, like. You know, we we really start seeing signals that things are changing dramatically. We're not going to stop. Now, that might mean we hold on longer than we would have in the past um, or we'll refinance things that we might have sold. But that brings up a good point. Um, you you brought up the 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 thought process of, OK, if y'all are on y'all are levered IRR buyers. Yeah. OK, so you're IRR driven. However, now you're probably going to be a little bit more focused on, okay, if we do have to hold on this, what does our cash on cash look like? Yep. And this is a metric that I had actually been pointing out for 
really the last 24 months or probably more so on the last 12 months where on some of these deals where you are experiencing such growth um, and you are an IRR buyer, how much of this is now attributed what you're buying today? What percentage of your returns are attributed to the residual? And we started seeing metrics that got a little high. Mm -hmm. And I say high, like upper 80s to 90%. (laughs) So what that's saying is through your cash flow during your hold period, you're pretty much ne- making nothing. Yep. However, you're su- you're very much banking on what is going to be happening in the future. Yep. Um, now it feels like in a healthier market, those figures were sixty to seventy percent. Yep. We're already starting to see that happen. So how quickly that changes? Where groups were giving you the oppor- they were giving you cr- so much credit for the future that ninety plus percent of your Value today is be is from the residual of the next sell. Yep. Now today they're going okay because the debt markets are where they are. We're not having to retool our mindset. We're sixty to seventy percent are going to be through the residual, and we're going to have to get about thirty to forty percent through our cash flow. You're right. I mean, if Jason was in here right now, he would tell you every single thing we're looking at is now a yield story. Mm-hmm. And for anybody listening that doesn't fully understand what. What Stephen just said is when you go to sell, if you make uh, $100 of profit, how much of that profit came from upside uh, on appreciation and how much of it came from existing cash flow during the life of the asset? And so when he was saying 90-10, it meant 10% came from cash flow, 90% came from upside. So you're betting on the come, whereas when it's 30-40 to 70-60, a decent healthy amount of that's coming through um, cash flow. Uh, we're playing that game a ton. And, you know, I think our company continues to evolve and not that we're not buying kind of the bigger box stuff within class B, but we've really started to find this niche in these, like some people now on Twitter have been calling them contractor sheds, Mm -hmm. but these 1500 to 3000 square foot spaces serve such a high need in society. Uh, my my new quote is uh, uh, America runs through Class B industrial because it's true. You go drive these parks and go look at the businesses that are in these parks. You know, we've lived this whole last few years um, thinking that like tech is everything. And I've fallen into that camp at times. And now I spend so much of my time just looking around like the built world. Like in America, we like clean roads. We like roofs that don't leak. We like HVAC systems that work. Mm hmm. We like our grass cut. We like our pools fixed. We like, you know, a good roof. I mean, all these things. All those tenants are in Class B industrial buildings. We like our cars fixed. We like parts for our cars. And so you you really get, okay, what actually helps us live the world that we like to live? And those tenants occupy our buildings. So then you ask yourself, um, okay, is that going to go away? It's like, no. In fact, we're starting to learn quickly. Like we need these people more than ever, especially in these cities that are booming. There's yeah. that many more houses to keep up with. There's that many more buildings, that many more roads. So that's big. Obviously you have the Walt story always when you, when, you know, when you buy a 300,000 square foot property and you have 120 tenants, you're basically managing a multifamily like property. Mm-hmm. You can sign one and two year leases. You can sign three year leases. Um, so I don't want to give our you know playbook away and not to say we're not buying big box, but we have found a home in these smaller deals. And, and a lot of people say, oh, they're really hard to manage. That's why we don't do them. Um, I won't get too much into it, but I hope my, comp- my competition continues to believe that way because I think we have found a way to manage them. And if you really look at our last six, seven buys, it's all that smaller tenant. Um, and um you're exactly right it's it's you're getting paid for the management intensive nature of the product mm-hmm. and but back to my point earlier it's uh where we're actually already starting to see the the highest amount of rent growth that are that's contractual is within the space yeah okay so it's now just a function of <laughs> of aggregating enough where you, you get, you're able to put enough dollars out because a lot of these are harder to find. Uh, sometimes they are smaller deals, but similar to the iOS, where it's they could be five and ten million dollar acquisitions. That kind of goes back to y'all's bread and butter. It's the 
it's the 10, $20 million deals that you're aggregating. And yep. at the end, uh, there is a portfolio premium and there's oftentimes a bigger fish in the sea. The the only other thing I would kind of, we I could say on, on my, where my head has kind of evolved to, and I, we can't quite put a, like a number on it is, um, all right, how am I going to say this? Okay. There is no vacancy in the market, especially on these smaller tenants. And again, this is my opinion. Anybody challenge me here. You're not finding tenant rep brokers that are just jumping out of their chairs to rep three and 5,000 square foot industrial tenants. Yep. The commissions aren't big. It's just, it's just not where you want to spend your time. So it's a lot more unsophisticated of a market. These tenants, when they go out to market to move spaces, they're not in the market a year in advance trying to secure. They're usually like, it's like, it's like shopping for an apartment. You're kind of shopping when you need it. Yeah. So you have no vacancy. But here's where my head's kind of gone. And, and I know this is attributable to office. It's attributable to anything that has to do with construction right now. But if let's just say you sign a lease four months out to go to a new building. Well, one, your landlord's probably going to lease your space well before you've moved out. So now you have that pressure on you. Mm -hmm. You're hoping to God that your new space is ready, that the TI is done, that's ready. Um, so that when your landlord goes, hey, man, you can't stay here and, and do a holdover rent like you got to get in that building. If that building's not ready, it's like an office. If the office isn't ready, you kind of tell everybody work from home for a couple of weeks until we get the office open. Or, you know, maybe you move in with a friend if you're in an apartment, move into an apartment while you wait for your apartment to be ready. But industrials, the, the real estate's a function of your business. You can't tell everybody in the warehouse, hey, everybody take a few packages home, leave them in your garage and we'll all move into the next space. So that's a long way of saying, I don't know how to quantify it. But I think it's even more of a landlord's market because there is a risk to moving right now, especially oh, yeah. in industrial. Um, I don't know what the risk is. I can't quite quantify it. But, you know, we just moved offices here and we were two months late and it was a hell of a yeah. deal. We Thank God we owned our building that we were moving out of. But for these businesses that need a warehouse to function their business, you don't have a lot of confidence right now that your next space is going to be ready on time. Oh, gosh. No. Downtime risk is a huge thing. Yeah. I mean, um, I can't imagine having to any of these groups are not going to be able to take off a single day. Yeah. And if, pretty much to move. They're yeah. going to they will have another lease signed and occupy before they leave in the, their space, especially if a tenant of that size. Yeah. All right. We've come to the end. If, if, uh, is there one thing that we can leave people thinking on that maybe has been on your mind? Like, is there anything that we haven't covered or a stat or a data point or something that would, we can leave people hanging on? Let me think. Um, look, I mean, in our, in our job right now, um, I'll say that we're seeing a shift and you, I think you said it best when you're talking about the deal that you are looking to acquire and the buyers right now um, have a little, maybe they have a little bit more leverage than we have seen in the past. Yeah. Um, however, I would say these buyers, there might be a window yeah. and, and this is a good thing. Uh, there might be a window. And so take advantage of it. Yep. Um, and I say that in a very healthy way. Um, but take advantage of it as when the world is thinking one way, you can take, you can see an opportunity and run through it where it might be blind to some. But um, if, uh, again, I, I think great volatility creates extreme opportunity. Yep. That's a great way to end this uh, market update. Thank you for coming over. You bet. Well, thank you.